Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, just wave at me if you can hear me. Oh, great, great. I can see that you're all there. Um, uh, my name is Maggie Bangana. I'm an advocate with the Rwanda Bar Association and the ELS Treasurer. I'm very honored to welcome all of you to the second day of the 25th East Africa Law Society Conference and General Assembly. The theme for this morning's session is revisiting the East African Community Common Market Protocol. As we all know, the objective of establishing a common market, this common market, is a re the realization of accelerated economic growth and development through the attainment of the free movement of goods, persons, labor, the rights of establishment and residence, the free movement of services and capital. The promise of a consolidated regional market has attracted investment and unlocked the potential for many sectors. Many companies have expanded cross-border trade, creating jobs while bringing a new dynamic to production and consumer economics. All that has been possible only because of the common market, which has succeeded at eliminating most of the barriers to trade and has brought about a sense of shared prosperity through job creation and a measurable improvement in quality of life for the average person. The past two years, however, have been particularly trying for some member states with political tension and the challenges caused by uh, COVID-19 have not helped. But as it is today, the situation would have been worse if we did not have the glue of regional integration which binds member states to some minimum commitments. Even if there have been moments of despair, the expansion of the ESC beyond the founding three members and the continuing aspiration of um, to join the club by countries such as the DRC, Ethiopia and Somalia attest to the achievements of our community. There is still some distance to cover before all the six freedoms that I mentioned above, that's free movement of goods and persons, capital, labor, services uh, can be entrenched. This is a good time to reflect and to revisit proto the protocol with the distinguished and knowledgeable experts we have lined up for you and amazing panel discussions that we have for every one of you today. Um, specifically, we have Honorable David Ocheng, a member of the National Assembly of Kenya and the regional integration expert, who will provide a status update of the protocol, how fight has been implemented, how it has helped spur free movement of people, goods, services, and capital, and also provide opportunities available for lawyers, as well as challenges faced so far. We'll also have Mr. Edwin Tabaro, who is a partner at KTA Advocates and former member of the Governing Council of ELS. He'll look at the protocol with a mutual recognition agreement for lawyers in mind. The agreement was drafted to allow the free movement of legal services in line with the provisions of the protocol. Where did things get stuck with this agreement? I'm personally very excited to listen and learn, and I invite you to do the same and ask questions and, and interact as much as you can during this session. At this moment, please allow me to invite Mr. Amol, the CEO of uh, the ELS, to share a few remarks before he invites our first speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maggie, and uh, thank you for opening our conference session of the day. And uh, I'm glad that uh, once again, we get to speak about uh, our pet subject, that the East African community. And uh, even better that we are talking about the common market protocol at a time that we are witnessing massive developments in the region, some positive and some obviously negative, especially the geopolitical tensions and the increased non-tariff barriers that we've seen. And even more sadly as lawyers, we are speaking at a time that you know, trade in legal services has not been liberalized despite good attempts at the past leaderships and even the current one of the legal profession in the region. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you again, once again, for joining us. Uh, we will be having a, a two-way conversation. Uh, the early part of this session will involve our speakers speaking to us, and then we will be getting into a panel discussion where at that point, we expect that you'll be able to shoot your questions and your comments using the appropriate uh, chat or Q&A uh, platform within this uh, Zoom link. And those particular questions will then be shared with the panelists and they'll be able to address them within this very session. 
So may I take this opportunity to introduce uh, the very first speaker of the day, Honorable David Ochia, as somebody who has worked quite closely with the East African Law Society as a consultant, as a speaker, as a member, and more often as our go-to person when we have questions regarding uh, the integration matters, especially the areas of trade. We've worked closely with Honorable David Ochia uh, in our cross-border support uh, project to small-scale traders and pastoralists, and he's been instrumental in this. Honorable David Ochia is a member of parliament, serving his second term as the MP for Ugenya constituency in the Kenya's National Assembly. But what he stands out for is not his role as a member of parliament, but his role in regional uh, trade policy, where he has made his mark on the development of crucial instruments in ESC, IGAD, and more recently, he stood out as one of the leading draftsmen for the South Sudan uh, Peace Treaty that was recently signed to bring in a government of national unity. So, Honorable David Ochim, please, the platform is yours. Please unmute. Okay, I think I've unmuted now. I hope I can now be heard. I can hear you, David. I hope Maggie can hear me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Maggie. Thank you so much, Huntington, and uh, to all the panelists present this afternoon, to all the participants and uh, the organizers of the conference. I'm happy to participate this afternoon in, you know, sharing views and ideas on what is happening within the region, especially within the context of the Common Market Protocol. And I would, I would want to start from a point of the uh, fact that we have now had ESC reintegration process uh, from the first fall to now for the last more than actually over 20 years now. And uh, we have gains that have been made. We've got opportunities that have been created. We've got challenges that have been felt. But I must say that I'm happy that we and our leaders you know, chose to reintroduce and uh, re-energize the EAC integration process. This afternoon, we're going to focus on the issue of the common market. How far are we? Are we gaining? Are we losing? What is the role of the lawyers uh, in this process? I just want to say from the beginning is that, that East Africa is part of the larger community of states and governments in the world. And, and therefore, our reintegration as, as EAC Happening from 1995-7 was a reaction to what was happening at that time in the world. That the WTO was formed in 1995. And in the aftermath of WTO, we saw regional organizations coming up from all over the world. We saw NAFTA being energized in 1997. We saw ASEAN in the uh, Asia coming up at that same period of time. We saw Mercosur, that is in Latin America, that involved Brazil and Argentina and the rest of the countries that in that part of the world coming up at that time. We saw ECOWAS coming up around the same time, SADAC being organized at the same time, even COMESA. And so the EEC must be seen in that framework that everyone wanted to be part of the emerging international conversation about economic integration. So that your markets are enlarged, so that you have capacities to negotiate as a region, so that you, are, you have bigger investment opportunities, so that you can have solidarity among your partners uh, and members, uh, states, and so that you can, as a little lo local reforms, to enable you to take advantage of the emerging economic activities, not about by WTO and also by the many regional organizations. And so we must view ESC in that regard. We must view ESC in the context of trying to pull its weight trying to ensure that it's region, it's region that has historical, historically been together, being able to consolidate the gains and, and, and ensuring that they are not being left behind. Now, implicit in this, for this afternoon is, have we achieved anything economic? Have we achieved anything to write home about? Over and above, we feel good for that we are, we are a regional organization and that we 
have a, a sector in Arusha and that we can say East African, is there any economic opportunities have been have arisen in the past? Now, fast forward to EAC, we had a very ambitious plan on how we'll integrate the region from 1999 up to now. Initially, we started with, with a loose arrangement, uh, what, what we call the EAC Corporation. When the treaty was signed, we now end up with very strong you know, objectives in there that provided for us a roadmap on how we will integrate as a region. And that's why in 2005, the community signed the EAC Custom Union Protocol, which largely covers how goods will be traded among the partner states. You know, removing tariffs, reducing tariffs when necessary, removing bottlenecks to trade, to move, allowing goods to move uh, freely across the borders. In 2010, we saw the community again signing the EAC Common Market Protocol, having implemented the, the Custom Union Protocol for the last five years. Now, moving from goods movement now to movement of people, movement of labor, movement of services, allowing people to move cross borders and you know, reside and establish themselves in those cross borders, movement of money and capital. So moving gradually from having very broad ideas of how to integrate through easing movement of goods, and now through easing the movement of individuals and what they have in terms of labor, capital, in terms of investments, being able to move, people being able to move cross borders and establishing and residing and feeling part of the community. And then a few years, years later, as you would now know, uh, the partner states again signed the Monterey Union Protocol, which now is also in the process of being, process of being, of being implemented with a hope that finally we'll end up with a political federation. So if I focus on the common market protocol, the idea here is to deepen and widen how we integrate by making sure that people are at the center of the integration process, not just goods, but people who consume these goods, people who produce these goods, people who uh, you know, benefit from these goods, are able to move freely. And it's in, it, if you look at Article 4 of the Common Market Protocol and Article 5, it will tell you why it is important, it was important for this to happen. Countries need to cooperate among themselves in bringing down and flattening these bottlenecks that would make people not be able to move so that you can move from Uganda to Rwanda without requiring a visa. You can move from Kenya to Tanzania without requiring a visa. You can move from you know, Uganda into South Sudan without requiring a visa as long as you have an agreed document for identification. You and I this afternoon in this conference are professionals, people who provide services in their, in their various uh, ways and, and means in life, people who are able to move across the borders and you can apply a trade like as a lecturer, as a teacher of the law, as a practitioner, as long as you qualify across the border. And we've got so many other services that, you know, doctors, you know, engineers, all these kind of people. And so the idea behind the common market protocol is to enable goods to move freely, but above all, to enable services to move freely. And under services, like Maggie said when she, she started, there are five main areas of movement. There's movement of persons, movement of labor, movement of services, and the right to establish and the right to reside. The, the right to establish being accompanied by the right to move capital and to invest in th these countries. Now, countries of EAC had to do a couple of things to ensure that citizens of these countries are able to enjoy you know, the rights and freedoms as established under the Common Market Protocol. And this would, for example, mean that we standardize how we move across the borders by having common identification documents, by having common travel documents, by harmonizing uh, our mutual recognition and academic qualifications, by harmonizing our labor policies, laws and programs, by ensuring that we have laws that allow people to move across the borders and establish, having laws that allow, allow people to access and use land, having laws that allow people to, you know, talk to landlords and get houses to live in 
and they sell with themselves. When it comes to moving on services, the most, most important thing there for lawyers to understand is the fact that, and largely this is the basis behind any integration initiative, is the fact that you are seeking to be treated the same. If you are Ugandan and you're coming to Kenya, and you know Kenya has signed into the Common Market Protocol, you are hoping that the Kenyan lawyer will be treated the same way you are being treated as a Ugandan lawyer. That a Rwandan lawyer coming into Kenya to, 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 to practice their law will be treated the same way that the Kenya treats their Kenyan lawyers. That when I move as a Kenyan into South Sudan to establish my legal practice or to teach law there, I'll have the same treatment as they do the Sudanese nationals who are lawyers. The same for doctors and other areas of service provision. And, and that is implicit in the principle of national treatment. That you, you will extend to the members or citizens of the African community. The same treatment you treat, you extend to your citizens. Number two is that if in case Uganda treats American lawyers in a better way, if in case Uganda extends some better treatment to British lawyers, lawyers from the Scandinavia, then even me as a Kenyan would be entitled to that treatment that Uganda extends to its most preferred trading partners. That if Uganda treats, Uganda treats American doctors in a particular way that is favorable, then even me as a Kenyan, I would expect to treat the same way. If Kenya treats the UK lawyers in a particular way that is more favorable than it does Ugandans, then the Ugandan will have a right to demand that they be treated the same way as Kenya treats UK lawyers. Now, that is implicit in the principle of the most favored nation treatment, that any good, any, any better treatment that you afford to any professional will be extended to any professional from the East African community. I mean, there are so many other regulations that then would guide how services are moved. Services are provided through four bands where the service provider moves. Sometimes the service itself only moves. Sometimes the company that the services provides a platform that enables people to you know, use these services and all that. But the, the main thing here is to be able to be treated in a way that does not promote or does not lead to any discrimination. Now, this is supposed to promote service provision, it's supposed to promote specialization, it's supposed to promote trade in services. The only thing that then needs to be done by the partner states is to ensure that the domestic regulations meet the requirements of the EAC law, meet the requirements of uh, the, the regulations, the procedures and laws and policies are in tandem with what the EAC protocol on common market provides for. Of course, the exceptions to, to the, some of these things like security exceptions, public health exceptions, and areas where countries just decide that we will not open up these services. You know, a case in point, Kenya, Kenya has borne the brand of this in the recent past. Uh, I think the day before yesterday, there was a story in the Kenyan newspaper about uh, a Kenyan who was going to work in Tanzania, had had all these papers uh, done well, but they refused to allow her in. They, say, they said that this, she was going to be an MD of a company there. The same thing happened some time back when Vodafone picked a Kenyan to lead to the CEO of the Vodafone, Vodafone Tanzania chapter there. And they said, no, they are Tanzanians who are qualified enough to take up this job. Now, whether that is legal under the EAC law or not, for me is your guess as good as mine. And, and this part of what I'm going to talk about shortly in terms of challenges to the re regional integration processes uh, as it were. Then of course, uh, we talk about being able to move capital freely moving decisions, movement of money and resources that will help you uh, establish if you are a self-employed individual and you want to move into another country like you want to move in South Sudan or Burundi to establish, then the ESC Home Market Protocol makes disciplines that will require that country to admit you and allow you to move monies and other resources into those countries that you want to invest and establish your business therein um, as the Common Market Protocol uh, provides. Um, there are so many other areas of cooperation under the Common Market Protocol that I think I just need to mention uh, that include cross-border investments, monetary policy coordination, financial sector policy coordination, harmonizing tax laws and policies, prohibited business practices that would make the business difficult and, and all that. 
but above all, they also disciplines in that law that promote fair and free trade, but restrict and discourage any practices that would, would undermine fair trade. Like, you know, if government is subsidizing another one to come and trade, there are laws that would enable the country concerned to stop that kind of subsidy coming to interfere with the business in that country. There are also laws on consumer protection under the Commonwealth Protocol that enable the consumers in the country concerned to ensure uh, the country concerned to ensure that as you provide services, consumers are protected and they're getting the right uh, services as the case may be. The protocol also has very detailed analysis on how the discipline, discipline the movement of persons, movement of workers, how to establish that of residence, and above all, the schedule of commitments on how, for example, Burundi, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania are saying we will remove restrictions on trade in services, like for example, in legal services, gradually. We will we'll move for opening a law firm the first year, we'll move for opening for partnerships the second year. So annex five of the protocol is very important for lawyers and to be able to advise their clients about who has committed what under that protocol. For example, I know Kenya opened up its market to lawyers from the rest of the country, from the rest of the region, but there are some limitations that, for example, Tanzania has put, the limitations that Uganda has put, the limitations that, Tanzania, that, 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 that Burundi has put before you're able to get into Rwanda and practice in there. As a Kenyan lawyer, for example, if I'm going to join the Ugandan bar, uh, initially the exams I was supposed to do, but the, the cases where I'm exempt of those exams and I can get in, and as long as I'm able to get a partner in Uganda, I can establish myself the following day and start practicing uh, my law. Most important for lawyers on this, I want us to look at the protocol on the common market in a very wider sense, not only for lawyers and legal practice, because in our practices, even in our, in our, in, in our countries, we don't only look at lawyers, we look at so many other you know, people. And, and I wanted to give an example here. As I feel the challenges of the common market protocol, how to implement it. That if, if, if you went to the, any border of the EAC today, talk about Malaba, talk about Chukura, talk about uh, Korudi, and be there for just an hour or two and check how the countries are going about facilitating and enabling people to move across the border you'll definitely notice there are some things that are amiss. The speed with which people are being, uh, being allowed to move sometimes vary from border to border. The requirements on how people are going to allow to move vary from border to border. The bottlenecks being faced by those who are supposed to transporting goods and services vary from border to border. Yet, we have common rules, we have common procedures, we have common laws that we're supposed to follow. So on a day, if you're in Malaba, you'll spend less than three minutes at the border because of the open one stop border post to move across the border and, and cross over it. But if you are in, say, Horili, you will spend another one hour because there are issues about confirming where, where you're coming from, whether your papers are right, not because your papers are wrong, but because of the attitude sometimes of the people there at the border, or sometimes because of the lack of fiscal infrastructure and facilities that will enable them to do this kind of a, a job. And so when you talk about challenges towards uh, challenges for implementation of the protocol, which I think lawyers should look at holistically, not just as a legal practitioners, but also as people who would represent you know, their clients within the larger framework of the common market and the EAC framework. Lawyers would be advised, in my opinion, to look at how the common market is performing and above all, how they can help their clients to benefit from the provisions of the common market. And I just, want, I just picked a few challenges, which I wanted to share with us, uh, which I think the lawyers would want to also look at as they go about their, their businesses within the, uh, the community. And some of these include, for example, if you are moving from Dar es Salaam to Namanga, and you are a tracker, you're transporting goods from Dar es Salaam to Namanga. How many roadblocks are you going to find along the way? One, the police roadblocks, and two, the way bridges, and three, just arbitrary, 
you know, traffic roadblocks that are, are put along the way. And how do these promote regional integration? How do these promote trading goods? And how do they promote these promote trading services? If you are crossing the border, and especially during this COVID period, you find that if you went to Namanga and another one went to Malaba or Busia, different rules apply in terms of how people move across the borders. A client would be easily be able to move their trust very quickly because of how the country is implementing the rules uh, of the ESC common market, the rules of, uh, you know, as the related movement of labor, movement of uh, services and all that. And, and so uh, I just wanted to list some challenges that countries have, you know, individuals have faced in the last few years since we started, we started implementing the common market protocol. And I would not list them in any particular order, but there's inadequate government structures and procedures to help the country, the, the individuals of the EAC to effectuate their rights under the, under the common market protocol. This erratic application of laws and procedures, some places still have lengthy customs, uh, documentation procedures, some places still have lengthy and duplicated immigration procedures, a lot of cumbersome inspection requirements, and harmonized standards, police roadblocks and checkpoints, like I said earlier, laws are not harmonized, rules and procedures are not harmonized, enforcement structures are not there, there is no framework for monitoring and evaluation. And above all, for lawyers, there's sometimes purely willful disobedience of the community law, apathy, or vazillousness in trying to protect sovereignty of the laws of the, of the country's concerned, and above all, just non respect to the rule of law. And so, whether your client is selling cassava or selling fish or is engaged in high scale business, coming, get, getting goods from China into ESC, whether, whether they're involved in small scale provision like border border business or just crossing the border with fish or crossing the border with maps and all that, these for me are very relevant to you because most of the time there's a lot of disobedience, a lot of lack of enforcement of the EAC law, but people don't know how to uh, deal with it, they don't know where to go. And one lacuna in the EAC common market protocol that you know, I always talk about is the lack of proper enforcement mechanisms. So your clients have not been handled well. Where do you go? Go to the national uh, courts? Do you go to the ESCJ? Do you uh, approach the ESC Trade Remedies Committee? Where do you, where, which is the digital settlement structure that you're going, to, you're going to invoke? Countries that every day wake up and just put up arbitrary NTBs, the non-tariff barriers to trade, what do you do with them? I always give an example, like for example, recently during the COVID period, and it's so unrelated to COVID, Kenyans, Kenyans sugar millers were able to get raw sugar from Uganda into Kenya in some place in Busia, and then, then they would crush the sugar and get sugar cane. But one morning, the minister in Kenya and Kenya just said, no, we're not allowing any raw sugar, more, any raw sugar cane from Uganda into Kenya anymore. And that was it. The laws have been trampled upon, but the, the farmers in Uganda have no recourse because they believe that what the minister in Kenya has done is right when it's clearly wrong. Tanzania wakes up one day and says, to, for, for the next one week, we're not allowing fresh milk from Kenya into Tanzania for the reason that we think they don't meet health standards. No one has measured, no one has tested, no one knows whether what Tanzania is saying is right or wrong. Okay? So, so this is a kind of thing that happens every day in the community. There's a lot of, you know, cheating and lying and just disrespecting the rule of law. But because of the cumbersome these settlement structures, because of lack of a clear these settlement programs, you find people just looking the other way. You get tired when you imagine that you have to go to the, to the office of the permanent secretary as a good office. You have to exhaust those remedies. Then before you, you do that, maybe go to the national courts. And you're lucky if that national court understands the ESC law. If you don't get there, you go to the ESC court. You'll be lucky if you're going to get an early hearing. But if you're trading in perishable goods like milk or fast-moving natural goods like uh, margarine and all that, how long do you have to approach the ESCJ or the national courts to get a remedy that will be respected on the other side quickly and to enable you to continue uh, trading? And so 
as we look at the opportunities for lawyers within the ESC, I would say that let us not look at opening law firms or trying to get to practice across the border as a serious opportunity. For me, that is not the opportunity that I'll be talking about. The opportunities that we should be looking at as lawyers is, has the ESC countries complied with the obligations under the ESC Council of Union? Have they complied with the obligations under the ESC Common Market Protocol? For example, have they harmonized their laws and procedures required? Have they simplified their border procedures? Have they come up with proper testing standards requirements as, as stipulated in the ESC uh, protocols? Have they done this? And are they implementing them to the latter? So that you are able to represent your clients, first of all, at the national level. The traders, the Ugandan traders, trying to ensure that they're able to trade within the ESC framework. Are they being treated by Kenyans the right way? Is Rwanda treating them the right way? Are they getting the treatment that's required under the law in South Sudan? At the beginning. Then you then want to come up and check. Is the private sector aware of their rights? Are these traders aware of their rights under the ESC Common Way Protocol? I know the ELS has been trying over the years to sensitize not just lawyers, but also traders and the private sector on their rights and obligations and their duties under the ESC framework. And so your client approaches you with a matter. Does he understand? Does he know that this, this ESC framework that he can use without necessarily having to go to the local courts and all that? Are you as a lawyer conversant with the, the ESC frameworks and how they can help your client uh, to, to ensure that they're able to get what they require? Your client is a doctor who wants to move from Kenya into Uganda to establish a, a medical practice in, in Kampala. What do they require? Sometimes there's nothing controversial. They just want you to advise them uh, on what they require to be able to establish their practice in, in Uganda. Or your client is an engineer who wants to establish and take off opportunities arising in South Sudan for engineering, for building roads and, and building uh, bridges and all these kind of things. How do you help them? By just knowing the ESC law and being able to take them through the due diligence and the requirements of the South Sudan law and the ESC law. They don't have to be controversial issues. So, so for me, these are the kind of things that we need to you know, look at as lawyers. How do we ensure that our clients, who want to establish a, a client who wants to establish a hotel in, in Burundi, and he wants to use the ESC framework as a basis. He wants to go through the red tape and corruption around it and say, I'm going to use the ESC, the protocol on common market that allows me to move in under the right of establishment and set up a hotel. What is required in that country? I want to move with my hotel manager. I want to move in with my waiters. I want to move in with my, my chef. What do I require to be able to move in my chef? Okay. There's this engineer who is moving and he wants to move in with his uh, draft person, wants to move in with his you know, four men. What do they require? What must they meet? What are the permit requirements and all that? So for me, these are the kind of things that I want, I would, I would like our lawyers to understand. You're not waiting for a case that will go to the ESCJ or a case that will go to the National Court, but you're waiting for a means of ensuring that you are part and parcel of effectuating the rights established under the command protocol by being able to advise your clients accordingly while you come uh, across them. Now, I know in most countries, and we are largely English in our approach to matters, but this is one of the areas where, as lawyers, we must solicit work. We must go out and ambulance chase, whether at the border points, whether at, at the airports, as the case may be, whether just having networks you know, in the professional organizations like Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, we have organizations for doctors, for clinicians, for drafts people, for uh, you know, engineers. I know political scientists, we have decisions for so many professions. You need to get networks in these places so that you're able to understand who is coming in from where, what kind of service do they need? Are there Americans coming in? Are there Britons coming in? Are there South Sudanese coming in here? What do they need? You know, in a, on a daily basis, so much corruption happens at the border points. So much corruption happens within the government offices because people don't know what to do. Now, lawyers could help remove that bottleneck of corruption by being able to create networks that is able to reach out to these people that can be able to facilitate their 
way of coming into our, our countries and do, do uh, trade without having any issues. Number three, on lawyers and opportunities. In my practice of trade law over the last 11, 12 years now, most of the work I do come from referrals, but above all, they come from work that a person developed. I want to give an example that in the last three, four years, Trademark East Africa, which is a donor organization, has just set up a shop in Uganda. They have an office in Uganda. If you're a lawyer in Uganda, do you know about that organization? Do you know about Trademark East Africa? Do you know about USAID hub project? Do you know that they require lawyers to help them implement what they do? And if you go to that, those offices, you'll find that there's legal work going on. There's legal research going on in those offices, but work is being done by Europeans. Work is being done by Americans because they're not able to access Ugandan and ESC lawyers who could help do the same work, probably at a cheaper rate. If you, for example, visited the Danish embassy tomorrow, or you walked into the EADB offices in the CDBD in Kampala, you find there's work going on there. But the lead lawyers are Europeans, the lead lawyers are Americans because they're not able to get local lawyers or they don't think there's capacity in that field locally, yet there could be that capacity uh, in the country. So being again able to create networks like in this particular you know, meeting that ALS organizes, sometimes I see them inviting donor organizations. If they don't, I want you to know that in almost every embassy in, in, in East Africa, there are economic departments and they are work, there's work going on on ESC, there's work going on on Comesa, there's work going on on economic cooperation that require lawyers to participate in those areas. Are you able to create those networks? Or you want to continue waiting in the office for work in people who want to be represented for criminal cases and all the kind of things. We need to create work. And I want to tell you that on any good day, if you work with the Ministry of Trade uh, in Rwanda, just talk to the persons concerned. Ask them what's going on on ESC. Uh, what are we doing on common market protocol? What are the challenges that uh, traders are facing? They'll tell you, and they'll tell you who to see within the Rwanda Development Board. They will tell you who to see within the Rwanda uh, private sector organization. If you went to Arusha, they will tell you who to see within EABC and who to see within the Tanzania private sector organization. The same in, in Kenya, and the same in Uganda and South Sudan and Burundi. Talk to these private sector organizations, the upsayers of the world. Let's get to know what's happening. If you invest in that over time, you, you may find work coming your way. Don't wait that somebody's going to come to work. And, and you know, people normally get biased. They'll say to go to the big farms, but so, some, most of the time, those big farms have no expertise in the areas, especially in the new areas and the new frontiers of law. Yet I also know that in the last 10 years, there are so many young lawyers, so many young people who have mastered in the area of integration, you know, trade law, economic law, but they end up re relapsing into normal practice because they're not able to create opportunities in this area. So I would request of us to try to create partnerships and just be proactive in trying to ensure that we're implementing the ESG law. And I would end by saying that as we speak today, I can tell you for sure that the ESC is on its deathbed. The ESC is not doing very well. If you have time later in the day and maybe in the week, check out how the, ESC, how the European court contributed towards the growth of the European community. Check at how, for example, the, 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 the decision of the European Court on Human Rights, Economic Law has helped enlarge the scope of practice in that area in Europe. And so I would just request us to uh, play our role, trying to put the duty bearers in the ESC, the ministers, the PSAs, the ESC secretariat on their toes and hold them to, their, to, to, to account on the words of the treaty, of the Gasum Union Protocol, and of the Comarket Protocol. Otherwise, uh, I want to wish you all the best in this, uh, in this uh, conference and hope that we together can help the East Africans effectuate their rights under the ESC uh, framework. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, David. Uh, I think that was quite uh, passionate, uh, you know, keynote especially based on your experience uh, on the East African community integration and on the trade. Uh, I know there'll be questions coming in uh, later. Please make use of the Q&A functions in the chat and we'll be attending to your question when we get to the panel session. Just for the next few minutes, uh, Mr. Edwin Tabaro will be uh, speaking to us 
uh, on, again, a subject that as lawyers, we find a lot of passion about. That is on the liberalization of cross-border uh, trade in legal services. Uh, Edwin Tabaro is a long time, you know, member of the East African Law Society since 2008 when he was called to the bar. He appears before the superior courts in Uganda. He's currently the managing partner of KT Advocates, which is uh, part of the Amani group, the foremost uh, leading intellectual property practice in the East African community. And having worked with Mr. Tabaro, uh, being a governing council member of the East African Law Society, uh, all the way from 2017, I am pleased to note that his contribution, especially towards uh, scaling up uh, the mutual recognition agreement has been outstanding. And I believe he's going to share more about this particular role. Welcome, Mr. Tabaro. Um, okay, thank you very much, uh, Huntington, CEO. Uh, thank you very much, ELS. And uh, I'd like to thank the former speaker, Honorable Chain. It's very good to know there have been people who have been on the journey uh, towards uh, um, realizing the integration process. Uh, I'm also happy to see the various members of uh, our society uh, who have been on this journey, trying to put together this uh, mutual recognition agreement. Uh, I see the founding, one of the founding uh, uh, members of ELS, Mr. JMM. I think these are things that started during their time uh, it culminated in 2017 when we were still on council with the under President Mujisha. But uh, I'm very happy to see everybody. Uh, Asante, uh, CEO, Makoze Chane, Magi, President Burundi, Uraho, Mwese Mwesemute, thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Cheng has given a very good background of the EAC uh, and its journey, the Common Market Protocol. Many times uh, when we're on this journey to have the MRA signed, and many times when we interact with uh, uh, traders, with businessmen, they ask us, you're asking how have we gone out there to do trading in the region? What about you, are lawyers able to uh, cross over and do legal business? It becomes uh, a boomerang to us as to why we, ourselves not practicing in other countries, it were the very same people who are uh, advocating for a uh, regional trade, free movement of persons, free movement of goods. And yet our MRA is in place, it has been negotiated successfully, but we're unable, not able to do it. And, and, and that's the whole point of this uh, discussion, to show you the journey, where we've come from, where we are, and why we need to conclude it. Of course, Honorable Cheng has really done much of uh, what I would have brought to the fore. I'll, I'll, I'll strictly go to uh, the contents and the salient features of this MRA and what it is. But basically speaking, the background is the bustling regional trade and the future transactions that are uh, anticipated as a result of uh, realization of the community. Naturally, with international business spawning all over the region, uh, movement of people, movement of, of, of persons. This, uh, the ESC and those who created it thought professionals would be one of the drivers of this, uh, uh, of this regional trade. Uh, and it's the reason they provided for liberalization of the legal market. Uh, of course, it's not just lawyers. And MRA is not just for lawyers. It's also for uh, pharmacists, architects, engineers, medics, accountants. So far, the MRS we can talk about that have been signed and are probably being implemented are engineers and architects. Uh, the others have concluded but have not been endorsed just like ourselves. So uh, to benchmark, we can look at engineers who are freely moving across the region, recognizing each other's, uh, each other's uh, 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 qualifications and doing the projects within the region. But uh, our role and our participation in the East African integration is clearly, clearly pointed out in the EAC, uh, Common Market Protocol, particularly Article 11, which provides for 
the enactment of a mutual recognition agreement or harmonization of laws to allow free movement of persons, labor, and the right of establishment. The ESC also passed regulation uh, six and seven, if you able to get it, I have a paper which I'll circulate. It particularly also provides that legal services, among others, are one of the uh, services that uh, uh, ought to be liberalized for purposes of driving the integration agenda. So we find root in the ESC system. We are actually obliged to uh, liberalize our services as long as your country is a signatory uh, to the ESC treaty and the protocols. So what, uh, what is the mutual recognition agreement? From Article 11, as pointed out, you have harmonization on one side, mutual recognition on the other side. Uh, a mutual recognition agreement is an instrument signed by professional associations originating from different countries to enable professionals from a home country to be recognized by the other country, what they call the host country under MRA. It's a well-drawn instrument with about 14 articles and covers all these aspects, which I'll just point out generally. The whole point of MRA, as Honorable Cheng has pointed out, is to do away with the discrimination. Under the Common Market Pro Protocol, the principles of non-discrimination of people from your partner states is something that is sacrosanct. You are supposed to treat the party from your other partner state just the way you treat your fellow professionals. Same thing as the principle of national treatment. So the MRA is meant to do away with discrimination. As you know, one of the uh, bottlenecks in uh, uh, liberalizing our legal profession to others within the region is the citizenship qualification. For example, in Uganda, Section 8 of the Advocates Act provides that one can only be admitted if he's a citizen of the country. Now, that is a bottleneck. It's a discrimination and is not in line with the uh, ESC treaty and the protocols. So ideally, these are things that the MRA is expected to rectify, to allow a process. And as Honorable Cheng has pointed out, there are timelines which I'll be able to show that each country was expected to follow for us to uh, liberalize and have these laws harmonized or some of them done away with, particularly the citizenship qualifications. So the MRA, um, I'll give reference to the ESC Mutual Recognition of Academic and Professional Qualification Regulations 2011, which was passed by the ESC. And uh, it basically centers on four things. The recognition of academic and professional qualification, registration procedures, competencies, code of conduct, and the disciplinary processes within each country. Note that the MRA, the subject of this is an existing professional. Of course, as uh, members of ELS or members of national bars, we are already enrolled and are practicing. So they give a two year limit for any person who would wish to be recognized in another country. Um, you may realize that this does not apply to a newly un enrolled advocate. That's something that many students keep running to ELS to do, but the MRA as is provided for by the ESC simply gives an opportunity for the professionals to uh, provide recognition systems to each other. MRAs have already told you have been signed by vets, doctors, dentists, but uh, on our part, we did sign as law societies and I'll be able to go through uh, uh, the salient features, uh, but it's basically the same. The issue is on recognizing each other based on harmonization, of the different uh, systems. Of course, we've got to appreciate that we, we vary. I mean, Rwanda Burundi has civil law. Law Rwanda has a mixture of common law and civil law. So does South Sudan. And on our side, Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania do have uh, uh, common law. But 
all these are a mixture that can easily be uh, handled under the MRA, and I'll provide situations where uh, it, is, it is provided for. So why do we need a mutual regulation agreement? One, we are treaty obliged. The protocol provided that we were expected to uh, sign an MRA as national bars, as ELF for recognition, for purposes of driving the integration agenda. As you know, the law doesn't act in a vacuum. The regional uh, uh, trade is expanding. Honorable Cheng has told you, he gave an example of the Bosia people. We know here in Uganda, there are issues of the milk traders, the cement. All these are issues that are cropping up as a result of opening up borders. The testing procedures is something very, very fundamental. Many lawyers have not stuck on. But how are we able to handle that if we can't be able to cross over to each other person's country? But however, the ESC system has made it very clear that we can be able to cross each other's borders for purposes of sorting out uh, this kind of thing. So we are treaty obliged. Secondly, it gives you an opportunity to expand your practice. We do have actually competition, but in my personal view, it's not really from East African lawyers. It's more from international lawyers. So an opportunity for you to grow a regional practice that can be able to compete or is a springboard towards the rest of Africa and probably the rest of the world. We are told of a law firm that has set up in London, a Nigerian law firm. There have been discussions for them to go into Shanghai, but how spread out are they in, in, in Africa? The whole purpose is that there's a lot of Africa business coming from those big economies to this country, but do we have the right uh, uh, people to compete? So we believe MRA provides an opportunity for expansion. Things like mergers, acquisitions of law firms, twinnings, networking. For the moment, we use referral system, which is good enough. But if you want to build a bigger practice, I'm certain regional presence, one-stop shop, those are the issues that people are looking at. The region has over 175 million people, East Africa combined. I mean, that creates a huge market, a combined uh, GDP of over 200 billion. That is an opportunity for anybody who would want to venture out there, uh, if he's able to, uh, to tap into this huge market. Um, the MRA also will provide for venturing into specialized practice or the growth of boutique farms. In your country, it may be too small a market to uh, do specialized practice, but if you spread out in all the seven countries, that's something that uh, uh, will be very fulfilling. I myself have done a lot of IP all over, and it, it's just an amazing experience. So we believe the MRA uh, would be able to benefit both you and the client. There are some clients who would want to move with their lawyers. Honorable Cheng has pointed out very clearly that uh, certain uh, professionals need to move with, with their investors. Uh, this is an opportunity on, 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 on getting it done. So how will the MRA work? This is something that we are asked when we are at council. Uh, I'll be able to point out two things. One, the MRA is not a floodgate, does not open a floodgate of uh, a litigation, or sorry, of a floodgate of, of lawyers into another country, not at all. Leverage has been given to what they are calling a competent authority. A competent authority is that which is created by your country to regulate the legal profession. So the competent authority will be able to determine the scope of work that you'll be able to do in another country or a foreign lawyer or an East African lawyer will be able to do. I believe this was borrowed from uh, the Europeans. The Europeans have what they call the European Directive, Lawyers Directive of 1998, which actually closes out litigation, closes out probate, notarizing to, uh, and limits it to only citizens of those particular countries. The MRA gives the competent authority to provide the scope of work for that particular uh, country. 
for the lawyers to be admitted. I'll give you an example. In Uganda, um, over 98% of the work is either land-related or inheritance. That's the biggest employment for lawyers there. And that is usually in the courtrooms or the land transactions or the family dispute. So about 2% of, it, of that is, is the commercial work. And I believe if we are to leverage on the European situation, same thing any country would do because the whole purpose of the MRA is to allow regional trade. So if the regional traders are coming into your country, then you can allow only that 2% of the work to be shared with all other countries. But however, it does not mean that they're coming in competition with, your, with the advocates. No, I believe they're actually increasing the commercial work in your country, but also giving you, the lawyer in that country, an opportunity to tap into commercial work elsewhere in another country. So it gives leverage to the scope of work. But I'm, 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 I'm glad to know, I'm glad to know that Rwanda Brewery doesn't limit. We've had lawyers who go there and uh, uh, do their work, almost practice everything without much limitation. So some countries are open to it, but leverage is given. Secondly, the subject of the MRA is the professional uh, and someone who has practiced for about two, two years. They look at one, the qualifications, uh, from university, the bar itself, and the two years of practice. If you're in good standing from your previous, uh, from your host country, or from your national country, then the other country is obliged to, uh, uh, to receive you. But subject, and the word is, is to use subject to the rules and regulations of the particular host country. Uh, the other salient future, is accreditation. If you apply, you're supposed to go through a system of accreditation. And we've already laid out what the MRA provides for. That is the uh, qualification. And uh, if you look at its annex, it actually provides for all the national bars and the, the universities from the different countries. All of us have a four-year degree. Some have a post-qualification, uh, sorry, post degree uh, back course of about two years. Others have one year. But those are the things that are yet to be harmonized. However, it recognizes that there are fundamental uh, similarities that need to be harmonized. If you recall very well, Article 11 provides for mutual recognition and harmonization. So these are the issues that need to be uh, harmonized. The other fundamental issue is the recognition between common law uh, practitioners and civil law practitioners. One, for the common law, it is easily provided that if someone is from a common law country, all that the competent authority has got to do is find out if the training and the qualification can be easily uh, accredited and there are no fundamental differences. Of course, subject to the scope of practice. So if you're coming from Kenya and you're going to Tanzania, Uganda, uh, uh, or, or the other way around, all one needs to look at is the qualification, your two-year uh, experience, and the only thing they can be able to limit you is on the scope of practice. For example, like we've pointed out, you can practice in Uganda or Kenya, but we leave litigation out of your scope of practice. Uh, however, you need to, one may need to know that uh, Kenya has already amended their law. Uh, the citizen qualific qualification is no longer available. They did admit very many lawyers, though, of course, this may not have been uh, subject to the MRA, but I think they anticipated. However, uh, I'm not very certain whether they continue to do the same, but the MRA primarily recognizes that this will be done among uh, common law practitioners. So same thing for civil law jurisdiction. If someone is from a civil law jurisdiction practicing in another and would wish to practice another civil law jurisdiction, all the competent authority has got to do is find out if 
the person or the lawyer has taken the necessary uh, the necessary uh, qualification uh, to qualify and must be of good standing. Of course, again, subject to the scope of practice. The complication comes in where a common law practitioner wants to uh, uh, practice in a civil law jurisdiction and the other way around. But we're happy to note that some civil law jurisdictions have dual practice. I believe South Sudan and Rwanda have gone a huge step in accommodating such. So at least we, did, we don't need to wait for the MRA. But however, the MRA provides that a competent authority, should such a situation arise, must be able to uh, uh, verify foundational knowledge and core competence in the host country. If the competent authority is not satisfied that such foundational knowledge and core competence uh, 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 is not there, then that person will be asked to take further studies in that country, examination or practical legal training. So it's still possible under the MRA, but still subject to uh, some of those qualifications. And I believe uh, the, 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 the competent authority will be able to guide. And we have seen this being done. Some people from particular common law countries uh, have been asked to do this further training and examination, and some have actually qualified after. They give them about a year. So um, it's still possible. The other category is the advocate who's trained outside East Africa, but has never been enrolled or recognized in any of the East African countries. So it is provided that this person would have to go back to his host, to his uh, home country, be recognized by that partner state, and then go through the formal process of recognition. Um, Article 11 and 13 provides for undertakings by the competent authorities to carry out regular audit for qualification requirements for the realization of the MRA. You might have realized uh, there are so many litigations in Kenya and Uganda from students who contest admission to the bar or contest ad admission on the role of advocates. The bar school, sorry, the bar school and the role of advocates. I think this is where the problem is. Uh, most of the competent authorities talk about the subjects, the citizenship qualification, but this is provided for now by the MRA. They're expected to keep updating, to harmonize, and ensure that these restrictions are removed. Remember, as Dr. Ocheng has pointed out very clearly under Article 6, I believe, of the Common Market Protocol, the principles of non-discrimination, principles of uh, uh, national treatment, all of these are enshrined in the EAC, which are part of our national laws. So keeping a law that, rem that uh, restricts a citizen from another country, a student from another country, is itself um, uh, a violation of the treaty, but there are undertakings by the competent authorities to do away with this. There are also further undertakings by the law societies to lobby, amend procedures, and allow the implementation of the MRA. Of course, uh, something prominent coming out is the code of conduct. If one person, one advocate, uh, uh, has an issue with transgressions in his mother, country and is admitted or uh, does something in another country, he's subjected to the host country and that host country is obliged to inform uh, his mother country about these transgressions. Uh, there's also the issue of professional liability, which is also a challenge, but it is also provided for by the MRA. One is expected to take the uh, liability from the insurance cover from both countries. Um, the MRA also provides for fees, but again, it also cautions uh, national bars and the competent authorities from charging more than what uh, the other nationals are paying. The principle of national treatment must be taken care of, and uh, no further charges should be levied as a barrier.
to the liberalization of, uh, of uh, uh, the legal profession in those particular countries. Um, lastly, it provides for the creation of a mutual recognition committee, which is enshrined with a duty to ensure that the MRA is implemented. That is the constitution of, of which is three members from each partner state, a member from competent authority, competent authority being uh, countries that, uh, sorry, the authority from government which regulates the legal profession. The chief justice or his nominee, CEO of the ELS, and uh, any other member that he may nominate. So in summary, the MRA does provide for free movement of lawyers. All we need is to implement it. It does have challenges. That, like we pointed out, there is a fear of, of, of competition, obtaining work permits, the slow issuance of the same. Same things Dr. Ocheng has mentioned. But all in all, I believe the challenges uh, are, are not as big as the benefits. So I believe if we put our time to uh, uh, getting it signed, uh, I see CEO's uh, timer is, is ringing, but in summary, one, Kenya was supposed to liberalize their judicial procedures concerning this field by 2010. Burundi by 2015, Rwanda by 2010, Uganda by 2015. Tanzania did not make a commitment. But all in all, the MRA was signed by all the national bars. It remains the attorney generals of the different countries. Those are the people expected to sign it. We did have um, a progress on that. 2017, in November, the president of ELS at that time, President Richard Mujisha, myself and the president of Uganda at that time, we did bring it to the attention of the head of the summit at that time. He put it before the council. At that time, the attorney general was present. He put it before the council of ministers. Sometime in January, the, the, the summit, the head of summit was held in Uganda. Unfortunately, uh, they deferred it to another date. We have not had a sitting of the heads of summit since that time. The matter is still pending, but I believe uh, with ELS's uh, contribution, with the members' uh, uh, enthusiasm to practice, we still need to push our countries to get it signed. Thank you very much. I have a paper which I'll circulate to the Secretariat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Taparo. Uh, I think uh, for the very first time or for a long time, uh, uh, we've not had uh, quite an update on the mutual recognition agreement and basically the state of uh, cross-border legal practice. And thank you for quite an elaborate, you know, exposition of where we are, the challenges we face in the process. Thank you so much. Uh, there are two more uh, speakers of the day who are joining us as panelists, uh, and I'm pleased to introduce uh, Laston Gulume. Uh, Laston is an advocate uh, admitted to practice in Uganda. He is the practice manager at LP East Africa, a cross-border law firm. And last one, his practice focuses on you know, regional integration. And he has had a lot of experience before the East African Court of Justice. And uh, I believe Comesa Court of Justice as well, amongst other tribunals. Uh, we also have Patricia Mutiso joining us. Patricia. Uh, has worked uh, with Oraro and Company Advocates, uh, basically steering their East African uh, integration uh, and trade practice, and currently, again, works uh, in the trade consultancy uh, within the East African uh, community with ELP East Africa. Yes. Patricia uh, brings in a wealth of experience to this panel, uh, holding specific academic and professional qualifications on international trade law and policy. And even as I have questions for Tabaro and David, based on what I'm seeing coming from the charts, may I kick off with uh, Patricia. Patricia, you've heard what has been said uh, this afternoon and uh, probably looking at uh, 
the Kenyan situation, and you've seen a question coming from Yagon Victor, specifically speaking about Kenya's commitment to the common market protocol. Uh, probably that's where you can have your five minutes and start our discussion. Do you think Kenya is committed to the common market protocol? And if she is really committed, what has she done towards you know, implementing the, the, the commitments under the CMP? And importantly, is the recent decision by Kenya's Court of Appeal, which effectively locks out lawyers and Peter to practice in Rwanda and Burundi from <coughs> expressly accessing the Kenyan legal market Again, it's the spirit of CMP. Probably you can have your views on that. Thank you. Thank you, Emil, for this opportunity. Uh, I will start with answering the question by Yegon, which actually asks if Kenya is committed to the CMP uh, with regard to the decision that was made by the Court of Appeal. And uh, my, my view on that is that um, Kenya, like the other East African partner states, um, is also addressing the issue of mutual recognition, which has been dealt with earlier on. And to say that um, that lawyers from Rwanda and Burundi cannot practice, um, it, it's twofold. Some people would look at it as unconstitutional in the sense that they think that it goes against Article 11 of the Protocol of the Establishment of Common Market, which states that it is very important to, to have the mutual recognition and harmonization of certificates. But it is a journey. I think it is a journey, and it is one of those things that CMP has yet, um, partner states have yet to handle, yeah? And uh, as was earlier indicated by the gentleman who was speaking of mutual recognition, uh, Edwin, that uh, so far engineers have, have, are, have, are up to speed with this and they are able to move within the partner state without a hindrance. But we see that lawyers, even Kenyan lawyers going to other partner states, sometimes there's an issue. So what I can say is that they work in progress and it could be argued two ways. Some people would argue that it's unconstitutional for Kenya to stop it, but then other people would be like, it is progressive because Kenyan lawyers are also not allowed to go and practice in, in, in some other countries. With regard to what are the accomplishments that Kenya has made when it comes to the common market protocol, we have seen a some headways we have seen the opening up of the border posts that's a trade facilitation area kenya has done very well on that we've also seen the issuance of common identification documents within the esc yeah like initially we were able to get the east african passport where you could be able to move from one partner state to the other but unfortunately as yet i think it's only rwanda where we can use our identification cards to go into so that is still progress as regards mutual recognition of academic and professional qualifications, that is also work that is happening. But I think Kenya has gone a long way because it is also able to, to do that. It's just some countries it cannot. Kenya has also amended its national laws and regulations to ensure that there's no discrimination of citizens of the other partner states. Yeah. And then we also have a uh, facilitation of movement of persons within the territories of the partner states. But I think the biggest achievement of all in the CMP has been Kenya's move in the trade, trade facilitation zones, where it's been able to open a lot of uh, border posts to open within um, 24 hours. Yeah. So I think those are my comments um, with regard to, to that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Patricia. Uh, I believe uh, the other speakers might also have their take later on on the question. But uh, let me turn to Laston. Uh, Laston, uh, we've not had your voice uh, this morning, uh, especially representing uh, the caliber of new growth in the profession, the young lawyers. Uh, probably uh, you could take some five minutes and give us your take. Uh, do you think uh, we are making progress uh, in the realization of the vision of the East African community, especially under the East African Community Common Market Protocol. And uh, speaking of the Uganda situation, uh, have you seen any development? And uh, do you think uh, that some of the geopolitical issues like the recent tensions between Rwanda and, and Uganda have, you know, have a correlation on the implementation or realization of the visions of the CMP? 
Uh, thank you, thank you, Huntington. I hope you you can hear me. Uh, I I want to also first Quite. thank my my senior uh, colleagues, Honorable David Yocheng and uh, Edwin Tabaru, for those very good presentations. But just right to get into your question, one, the question of the East African community and the realization of the integration agenda definitely can only succeed to the extent that the stakeholders are fully invested in helping in making it work. And to the extent that we are discussing as a legal profession, where are these opportunities that we can benefit or that we can harness from this economic integration? Uh, I think uh, Honorable David Ocheng did justice in giving a very good overview, and I love his concluding remark that the ES is on its deathbed and we need to do something about it. Of course, we can't forget that uh, we are dealing with a community that once failed, it is revamped and we still have challenges on making progress on realizing the objectives and the agenda with which the three initial partner states set off to, to revamp this community. So there are opportunities in the community and true, uh, it is true also that there are certain impediments or there are certain hindrances that have, uh, that have faced a realization of this agenda. But for the legal profession and for the question that you asked uh, Huntington, in my honest view, I think there is so much progress that is being done, notwithstanding the fact that there are challenges on, uh, on the part of a couple of stakeholders who are not meeting the obligations they are required to meet. Uh, Honorable David Ocheng, my senior brother, you also pointed to that, that there are these reforms that we are required to undertake and, and, and these laws from the Treaty on Establishment of the East African uh, Community and the current protocol we are discussing, the Common Market Protocol, they are quite clear as to the obligations of the partner states. The reason as why some of these obligations have not been met, uh, I, I would think lack of the political will could be one of the reasons and the extent to which the different stakeholders in these different partner states are willing to actually fully implement their obligations. I had the benefit to at least participate for about two years in a program that was tracking the implementation of the common market protocol in Uganda and, and, and Tanzania. And I think Honorable David was doing a bit of the same project with his team. And you could clearly see that laws were being enacted which do not conform to the requirements of the treaty, which do not conform to the requirements of the common market protocol. We are advancing as an integration block and, and, and we are looking to getting into a fully fledged political federation, but we have to be willing to, we have to be willing to, to sacrifice certain things that we are still holding on. My, my honest assessment is we seem to want to eat our cake and have it. The partner states will commit to certain obligations, but when it comes to implementation, you don't see the implementation being done. For example, for these old laws, some of our advocates or the laws that regulate our practice in the different partner states, they were definitely enacted before the common market protocol, even before the uh, treaty on establishment of the ESC. What the common market protocol requires us to do or requires the partner states to do is that you take progressive and you take reforms that are intended to do away with any limitations, any impediments, any discriminations that are in the old laws because they were enacted in a different setting before we hopped onto the bus of the regional integration agenda. Clearly, Huntington, as you pointed out, this border closure issue between Rwanda and Uganda and so many other instances, the blocking of certain goods moving across borders in partner states, show you that whereas on paper, we so much have the commitment to have this integration agenda advance. We have, on the other hand, when it comes to actual execution, not abided by our bargain in these instruments. So the position and the challenge that that, uh, such, that uh, such a situation poses is what I think Honorable David proposed and, uh, and Edwin, that as lawyers, as legal practitioners, as legal advisors, as facilitators of business, because we are talking about an economic integration where the ultimate goal is how do we facilitate business in all advisory of business you'll find a lawyer there 
Now, how do we harness this opportunity that comes with a bigger block, that comes with bigger jurisdictions, with the merging of these different partner states in the integration? And for me, from where I sit, I have been one of the people that have enjoyed this, uh, the benefits of the East African uh, common market or the ESC community to the extent that now you're able to tap into the opportunities that come from cross-border practice amidst these challenges. I think what, what we need, and this is what I want to point out, is that when we think about the supply or movement of services, the MRI we are discussing, it falls under about two ambits of the, of the common market protocol. One, you're looking at the movement of workers as labor. Two, you're also looking at the movement of uh, the, the, the movement of persons, when these people have to move. And we have a, a proper legal framework. It still has areas that need to be negotiated. And I think that's some, those are some of the things that Edwin's presentation was touching on. What are the areas of renegotiation? As we are thinking about this MRA, what areas should we be thinking about? So I want to highlight these four things. That in the supply of services, you have about four modes of how these services are supplied. And if someone understands how this works, it is easy for them to tap into that opportunity. You have the cross-border supply. I sit here in Kampala at LP, and I have, we have a client in Kenya, we have a client in Tanzania, we have a client in Juba, and we are able to give them advisory from where we sit without moving a chair. We are seated in our Kampala office, but this client, because we have, you have positioned yourself on key issues on integration, and this client, is having business across borders. This is why the client in another partner state will look for you in your partner state where you are. Because they are doing transactions and businesses across borders, they have an issue in your state. They have an issue in your country. But their lawyer probably is in Kenya. Their lawyer probably is in Juba. But they need legal services from a Kampala or a Uganda firm. But this client is not going to move to get those services. So the cross-border supply of that services enables you to give that legal service to the client who is in another partner state. The consumption abroad, this is where as a mode of supply, this is where the client has come into the country. They find themselves, they need a legal, they need a legal service. Let's say it's a Rwandan who has come to Uganda and they won't be calling their lawyer in Rwanda. They're already in Uganda. Can they be persuaded that because of the ease and what we are talking about in the um, uh, mutual recognition argument, that if I am getting a service from Uganda, if it has a spillover issue that has to go back to my home country, the same lawyer, the same firm, the same advocate, the same legal advisor can even leave their country and come back to my country to make a follow-up on, kind of, on that kind of legal advice. I'm talking about, for example, a tourist who finds themselves in another partner state and they get a legal issue and they need a legal service. Currently, what we have is one lawyer will start on the matter in Uganda. Should it cross over back to the home country, let's say Tanzania, they will have now to get another lawyer in Tanzania. And yet the consumption abroad started when this person had moved to another partner state. And the third kind of uh, supply of, uh, of the service is commercial presence. And this is where we want to have facilitation of these different law firms in the different partner states being able to work with to work in other partner states having offices. The commercial presence requires you to have a, an office, a physical office in that partner state. But you can't do that. If you want to establish, for example, a branch of your law firm office in Tanzania, if you don't have, uh, if, if you don't have a citizen, a Tanzanian, a practicing advocate, you can't do that. And I think same challenges are cutting across in the different partner states. And the last is the presence of the natural person, which brings in also the challenges that come with having restrictions on free movement of people. We've been giving an example of how it's easy to use your ID, I think, to go to Rwanda, and we are thinking of an East African passport, but in our legal framework, we realize that because of none, not taking reforms in some of our archaic laws or our old laws, we have ended up having the will, but what needs to facilitate the achievement of this agenda has not been worked on. Our role as lawyers, and our points of renegotiation come in when we first understand how does integration work, which I think in the very short time that Honorable David had tried to give an overview. But also secondly, the question that was asked, if a client is having a challenge, and this is what Honorable Cheng asked, 
where do you go? Where is the remedy? That is the value that we add as lawyers. If traders who are trading across borders are having challenges, are we going to be relying on our domestic law purely as it is? It's a settled principle of law across uh, both, in, both in the ESCJ and also uh, I think in some of our local courts that community law and even our instruments, our ES instruments are clear on that, that community law takes precedent over domestic law. Some of these decisions like the BAT decision against uh, Uganda where you had uh, uh, a bad imposition that was placed on BAT goods and BAT had to run for help, seek for help before the ESCJ. I think some passed just the brick and mortar normal practice, which I think my senior colleague and I were pointed to, we have to think outside the box. And when we think outside the box, there lies our opportunities. On the MRA briefly, Huntington, there are so many areas of renegotiation that go back to the annex chairs and the schedules to the common market protocol. I think Edwin was, in the short time he had, tried to point to us that some of these partner states made commitments that we are going to remove all these restrictions by 2015, by 2013. It's 2020, uh, and we still have the same restrictions if not having more restrictions being added through our legislation or through our administrative measures that are taken. So our role as lawyers first is to understand what this ESC is. And secondly, in us discussing the mutual recognition agreement, we also need to position ourselves in a place where we are able to facilitate the traders and advisors. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Laston, for that exposition. I think it has covered uh, actually some of even the concerns that were being raised on the chat, but thank you for just bringing that out quite clearly. Uh, now, uh, I still have uh, some questions to tackle, even though I've already run out of time, but I think it would be all fairness that we spend even just the next 10 minutes to tackle them. Uh, uh, the CEO of Pan African Lawyers Union and uh, the gentleman of fairness made the greatest movement towards uh, you know ensuring that the east african law society entrenched its hooks into you know the regional integration work uh, while he was served as the ceo of the east african law society he's having a concern and the concerns revolves around uh, the matter which is well known to us uh, regarding uh, you know the rights of residents uh, and the rights of establishment under the East African community. Uh, we've seen uh, recently, you know, the partner states having measures and countermeasures, and Tanzania has especially been singled out, blocking out uh, pursued foreigners, who are from Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, who are trying to settle in for professional opportunities on invitation, and blocking them on grounds that either the jobs can be performed by Tanzanians, or for one reason or another, they cannot be given uh, rights of residence or of establishment, while the protocol is clear that this is not something to be limited to the citizens of the East African Community Partner State. So Don is asking whether you think there's a path through which this can be litigated at the East African Court of Justice, or we have to work away of ensuring that this is realized, not necessarily through litigation. Probably you can just take two minutes to exercise your mind on that before I come back to Mr. Tabaro. Honorable David. Could you unmute? Please unmute. Yes, Huntington. I've posed a question to you uh, from Donald Dare regarding the right of establishment and residence in the East African community. And he was highlighting uh, the, you know, the prevailing situation, especially with Tanzania, rejecting professionals coming into Tanzania from the rest of the Eastern Community Partner States on the basis that those work would be performed by Tanzania for one reason or another. And the question is whether there's a pathway to mitigate this at the East African Court of Justice or as a professional involved in this field, you think that we should adopt other measures other than litigation? No, th I, thought of, I thought of, thought about this earlier. This is what I call willful disobedience, refusal by Tanzania as a country to
to respect the ESC law. Let's not call it another way. Let's not even put food around it. Tanzania is not respecting its obligation under, under, the, under the ESC law. And they must be called out, first of all, by ELS and all of us who mean well for the ESC. But number two is a matter that must be litigated as a matter of public concern, even if the persons, persons involved would not want to go to court themselves. It's a matter that we must go to court ourselves at ESC as ELS, so that you know the ESCJ is able to, you know, in my opinion, not, not even not even give an opinion, confirm what the community law says, confirm what the protocol says. There's, in fact, for me, there's no two ways about this. If if the because Sometime back it was a lady called Mulinge from Safaricom, who was supposed to be CEO of Vodacom. Now, I think this week there was somebody who was going to be, I think, uh, a CEO of either a bank or a subsidiary of some other company. And they just told him, I mean, they had cleared everything else, interviews done. The only thing remaining was a permit. Now, the exceptions, exceptions to, uh, in the common protocol, to these kind of positions are very clear. It cannot be based on the fact that somebody else can do this in Tanzania. This exception only happens for lower cadre professionals, not, not that high level professional, where a company has chosen what it's supposed to do. It, it can't uh, be bought. The other exceptions are about national security, public health, but not a political exception like this one, where somebody decides that this one we won't allow because we want Tanzanian to be. No. It, in fact, it, it, it is basically handing to not just an abrogation of the common market protocol, but also. It abrogates everything that the ESC treaty stands for, not just the Common Market Protocol. It, it, it basically is the antithesis to what the ESC stands for. And we can't allow it to pass. I hope Huntington and ELS and other spirited you know, civil servants and public servants in the ESC will take this up. I wish I could personally take it up. You know, we should have the ESCJ say something on this. Thank you, thank you, thank you, David, uh, uh, for that exposition. Mr. Tabaro, are you there? You can confirm to me, and uh, there are questions here that uh, are directed to you. I can see you've unmuted. Thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, from the chat, you've seen quite passionate comments coming in, especially from uh, uh, Patrick uh, Castera Okelo, who I'm well aware of, admitted to practice in, in, uh, in, in Rwanda and Kenya. But obviously, after many challenges, as he has put out there, and quite sadly, uh, it comes out that the national bars have had a role in trying to protect the national markets from the rest of East Africa. And uh, Mr. Kasera is pointing out uh, that in the case of Kenya, looks like the Kenyan bar was actually the one who was active in trying to lock out participants from Rwanda and Burundi. Not quite clear what that the position is, but the truth as it comes out, is that the national bars, who are also constituent members of the East African Law Society, have been, uh, you know, they've been, they've been involved culpable in a way that they are either standing idly as others are being blocked, or they are actively participating in ensuring that the national laws are given prominence over the community law. So what handling that, uh, you could combine it with a concern also from Esther of uh, spreading again this very particular point. And Esther's observation, if I could just read it out without, uh, you know, basically blocking is that uh, on, you should like to know what ELS is uh, planning to do regarding the stalemate on free movement of legal services, that uh, even though the opportunities go just beyond setting up physical brick and mortar law firms, but it's also frustrating that advocates from the rest of ESC country moving into another ESC country are being subjected to meet very stringent requirements that they have to meet the national qualifications in those countries, like in Kenya being asked to go through the Kenya School of Law program, and in Tanzania going through the same, the, the, you know, the advocates training program, while somebody is already qualified as an advocate. How, how do we deal with this situation? And I think it ties very well with what you were discussing earlier. Okay, thank you very much, CEO. And thank you very much, Patrick, and uh, the rest of the team for those questions. Uh, first of all, I sympathize with the national bars and the courts, because as you know, the role of courts is to interpret the law. The national bars will administer the law as it is when it comes to admission, 
of lawyers in some jurisdictions and the regulation of lawyers. The law as it is now, as I had pointed out, has not been harmonized. In as much as the EAC uh, has a treaty which provides for harmonization, all that a court needs to do is simply interpret the law. In Uganda, we have two litigations that are, are very prominent, uh, interpreting particularly section eight. The hands of the courts and the hands of the judges are tied. Uh, you brought my attention the Court of Appeal decision from Kenya, but this is what exactly we're talking about. The MRA is meant to cure these issues. Patrick, who is from Rwanda or Rwandan trained, yeah? You know, there's a difference between being Rwandan lawyer, Ugandan, or Rwandan trained, Ugandan trained. That is why the MRA looks at the qualifications. You can be a Rwandan in Rwanda, but when you have the qualifications, from a common law country. That is why the MRA provides for the competent authority to look at the qualifications. So if they ask you to get further training, perhaps you are lacking the foundational qualifications in the core competencies to practice in that particular law. It is not blanket, but again, it does not in any way lock out anybody. Our MRA provides for the recognition of advocates who are trained and qualified in other countries from civil law countries. But the problem is we have not had it implemented or signed. And there's the issue of harmonization, which is supposed to be championed by the law societies after signing. So I don't think we can put a blame on LSK or even the Tanzanian government, not at all. The issue is getting that MRA to, into the EAC system, it is signed, and then the harmonization process takes place. I think Patrick's problem and LSK is that we're now putting the harmonization before the MRA. And that is why we have this talk. Let us adopt the MRA, it cures everything. I, I, I'm sorry we're not able, but I'll be able to give you a copy of it. We look at it deeply. It cures all the things we've been speaking about. The other issue uh, that you've spoken about, how are the law societies able to champion liberalization? They've already done it. Let us give credit to uh, these people. It started with Don Dare. When I came on ALS Council, Don Dare had been, I think, CEO eight years or so before. I was there two years ago we're entering the fourth year. The MRA really has taken 10 years. So the law societies have done their part, but the integration process is so, so slow. We can't blame them, but on the other hand, all we can do is, 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 is advocate for the passing of this MRA. It is a magic wand in the liberalization of legal services because it is an instrument that has been negotiated by national bars, the presidents, all the presidents you can think of, all our national bars have been uh, part of, have negotiated this thing. We also don't want to become senior counsel before this thing is, 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 is passed. I think right now in this conference or even tomorrow when we have the AGM, let us pass a resolution and ensure that this thing is done before all of us retire from this legal profession. I am certain, and I don't know whether I've convinced you, but it caters for all those situations. Secondly, on the issue of, uh, of the implementation of the Common Market Protocol, uh, Oleg Pocheng has pointed it out very, very well. The protocol is there, so is the customs uh, union, and the enforcement mechanisms. I, when we were in law school, they used to see lawyers would turn black into white. Uh, I, I believe, he, like Oleg Pocheng has said, it is a dead institution. If we, 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 can black, we can turn black into white, then as lawyers from EAC, let us resurrect the dead person in the EAC through litigation. He has put it out European Union and the European Union court uh, breathed air into the integration processes in Europe. Lawyers litigated, enforced the thing. We need 
to challenge some of the things whenever they come up, which has happened. There are quite many litigations, BAT versus Uganda that struck down Parliament of Uganda's uh, legislation on a barrier, a barrier, they placed a barrier on tobacco. Uh, we have the Cafe Java's case, where, where uh, one trademark was already registered and hoped to block. Under territorial uh, jurisdiction and uh, respect for IP rights, such a thing would never happen. But we have a very peculiar law. The ESC, Honorable Cheng, you may need to, to know that our courts have applied the ESC law in our national courts before. And I would like you to look at that case, Mandela Autospores, Autospores versus Nairobi Java House. Nairobi Java House tried to register trademark. In typical IP law, everywhere in the world, by the way, when you register your trademark, it's just territorial. Nobody would, you cannot protect it in another country unless you've registered it. Nairobi Java House never registered it. But the lawyers, the judge said no, in as much as IP is territorial, we have ESC law that allows free movement of goods. These, these were lawyers like us who litigated. Of course, the matter is on appeal now, but- You're right, I know about the case. Yeah, yeah, sure. So yeah. we can breathe air into, into this court. Unfortunately, when we did, Huntington, you remember, a survey on the awareness of the EAC law and the courts among lawyers, we were very surprised. Not many people know it. And there were more human rights cases than trade disputes. We have a common market court protocol. We have a customs union. Ideally, we should have, you'd expect more trade disputes, though it also showed that uh, there are many human rights issues. So at another point, we may have to discuss a human rights protocol, but at the moment, implementation can be done if lawyers rise up to the day, breathe air into the EAC, challenge some things, and resurrect uh, uh, the EAC from the dead. I'm very certain this can be achieved. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Edwin. I've seen uh, my boss's uh, image on the screen, and that is a signal that uh, our time is up. I wanted to give each one of you more time to speak, but unfortunately, I now have to invite uh, Maggie Bangana to wrap the session for us, as we have another exciting session coming up this afternoon in the next few minutes. If possible, don't log out. We are now talking about ELS at 25. We are revisiting our history, and for many of you, like me who came quite late after this journey had started. Probably we are getting a once in a life opportunity to hear and it started from the horse's mouth. So in the next few minutes, log in. But for now, let me invite uh, Maggie Bangana, our treasurer, uh, to officially close this particular session for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Huntington. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, thank you so much all for the uh, insightful discussions. I have myself learned a lot. Um, uh, some of the things that sort of depressed me was uh, the knowledge that ESC might be on its deathbed. Uh, in, and I've had a bit of medicines and vaccines that could resurrect it and all the things that we need to do as uh, national bars and as a collective society to be able to make integration a reality. You've really all been amazing, amazing. I'm very grateful uh, for your time. And I would like to again, thank you so much on behalf of the ELS Secretariat. Uh, with that, I would like to declare this session closed and I welcome you to stay for the second uh, part of this discussion. Once again, thank you very much.